Okay, so we've got a few other people to join us, but we might as well start with some of the formalities. So thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, unfortunately, Michael's been delayed. He's in Parliamentary Crime and Corruption Committee committee at the moment who are presently looking into the dismissal of the Logan City Councillors and it has gone longer than expected. So Michael sends his apologies but welcomes you and thanks you for being here today. Today we've been joined by um, some guest speakers who've got some really good information for you. So we've got Saborn from Saborn, sorry lovely, Kata from the Grants Officer Community Benefit Funds Unit. So they do the Gambling Benefit Fund. Uh, so that one comes around four times a year, I believe, but you'll get lots of information. We've got Chris Wagland. He's the Senior Advisor, Sport and Recreation, Department of Tourism, Innovation and Sport. So Chris has got some grants that are opening soon that are really exciting, and he's looking forward to sharing that with you. We've got Nikki Moore, who's the Coordinator of Controlled Entities and Community Grants for the City of Gold Coast. So Nikki's going to talk about Gold Coast City Council um, grants. We've got Nathan from Stuart Roberts' office. Stuart's the federal member for Fadden. So Nathan's got a bit of a PowerPoint about federal grants that are available and opportunities. We've got Matt from Councillor Mark Hamill, Division 1. Uh, so Matt's going to be mainly in question and answer time about local grants to help the community, um, sporting and community groups, so from Mark Hamill's office. Then we've got Vanessa who will be in the question and answer time from Bert Van Manen's office. Bert's the federal member for Ford, so um, we've got Fadden and Ford and Vanessa will be here for question time for um, federal office. So the way the information session is going to run, I'll hand over to our guest speakers um, and then at the conclusion we'll have question and answer time. You'll also receive from your registered email that you provided a cheat sheet of grants that are talking about and this recorded version. So you can see the PowerPoints that the guys have taken the effort to put together for you to help you. Um, so. We are recording. If anyone's got any objections, let me know. But I'm ready to hand over to Siobhan and she'll take over with regards to the PowerPoint for that. So over to you. Thank you, Judy. I'll just pop up the PowerPoint to go into that position. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. okay. Okay, well, as Judy said, my name is Siobhan Ketter and I'm the Assistant Manager for the Gambling Community Benefit Fund. Um, I just put a little um, PowerPoint presentation together for you guys today. You can just, it's an overview of our fund and um, we've got a lot more detail on our website. Um, so we'll just start with um, approximately 60 million goes out a year. Um, that tends to go up every now and then, but it's 57 last year, so it's not 60 this year. Um, this year, in 2021, we have five funding rounds. Um, which closed, well, the closing dates now, we've just had one for us on the 31st of August, and the last one will be the 31st of October. But from 2022, we're going back to four funding rounds, which what we were previously, pre-COVID, I could say. Um, but what we've done to just to alleviate the concerns of dropping a round is made one round a super round, which is the, 28th, the, the closing round for the 28th of February. And that will give you a limit of $100,000 to apply. So you can still apply for up to 100. You don't have to apply for 100. You can apply, still apply for your 35, 10, 5, whatever you want. Um, just to, I'll, I'll go into a bit further, but that's only once a year. So the other three rounds, which will be May, 31st of May, 31st of August, and 31st of October, that will be the up to 35,000. And that limit of 100,000 is going to be an annual thing for the first round of this year. Okay, next. Uh, the next one, this is just a, a list of the steps to success. So we're going to go through the six steps. Um, um, we're going to go through planning, preparing, writing and submitting, assessment, the funding decision, and the equipment of the grant. So the very first thing, obviously, is to work out whether your organisation is eligible. So most of you guys who are here today, I'm assuming, is not from, from not-for-profit objectives and perhaps are not-for-profit organisations, 
um, you're either incorporated or have an active department, or you're going to consider being sponsored, which means you can still be not for profit, but you um, will, will need one of these guys that are incorporated or have an active department to sponsor you. Um, if you are sponsoring an organisation, you've got to accept the financial and legal responsibility. So if you if you are considering sponsoring an organisation, be aware that you will be the ones that will contact the social Jew and, and you know, just to make sure you know that there is some sort of responsibility with that. If you're a local ambulance or a rural fire brigade or state emergency service, you've got to be sponsored by your relevant government department. So, uh, everybody, that's very clear in the guidelines as well. Um, a new thing that we've got, you've probably seen it in the news, is about applying for monuments over $35,000. Um, when they originally advertised the grant, they kind of insinuated that you could apply for up to 100000 for a monument, but that's not the case. If you can apply for a monument, then you can apply for anything else as well. But if you do apply for a monument that's over $35,000, you must be sponsored by your local council, or the council can find their own right. The reason we've done this is because obviously everyone's only lots of monuments and the council aren't happy about it, there's going to be a lot of drama. So we've just said, let's just make a blanket rule. If it's over 35,000, you must go through the council. Um, then deciding if the organisation is ineligible. Well, it is if you're a private limited or a public company limited by shares or a state private or independent school. Now, the schools around 104, so from February 2020, we, we made schools ineligible, but instead we've changed it that PNCs and PNFs can apply. So it's still the fundraising on that's able to apply for the school. The reason we did that was we were finding that schools were applying and the PNCs were applying and they're sponsoring each other and they, they tend to get a lot of funding applications for coming from one area. And that's probably where we're very oversubscribed, so we're really trying to reach four areas. Okay, next one. Um, is your application eligible? Well, you pretty much are eligible if you demonstrate benefit for Queensland communities. Um, obviously, the organisation has to have to admit those previous um, guidelines, which I mentioned before. Um, you, you application would not be eligible, though, if you're awaiting the outcome of a previously submitted application. So that means, for example, we've just had round 110 quotes, so we're actually considering 110 applications now. Um, but the uh, 111 is open. So um, if you submitted one in 110 and then when it's submitted one in 111, no matter what the outcome of the application in the previous round was, you still would be considered eligible for the second one because you didn't like the outcome. And that was another thing we put in place to try and reduce the amount of applications we were getting in all the time because we were getting, you know, 1,700 applications. People just kept popping them in. And um, it, it, it meant that we had to, you know, Obviously, the assessment process was longer, but it also meant that it wasn't giving groups that might not have applied in that time a, a fair opportunity. They had too much competition, so we knocked a few things out. For example, um, after your application closes. So if you're successful in a grant and you um, closed it, so you've gone, done your acquittal documentation and you close the grant, you can't then go straight away for another application. You have to wait around. And that also just you know, reduces the amount that coming and gives everybody else a better opportunity. And also, obviously, you can only ever have one application, live application at a time. So if you have a previous application and have not yet acquitted, you, you would be considered eligible as well. Um, the, the application, if it's missing information or is incomplete, um, there was a time that a lot of you guys have provided or been with us for a long time. You know that there was a time that we used to come back and um, spend a lot of time going back and forth to organisations to say, listen, you know, if you miss information here, please provide it and give you opportunities. But as we have got bigger and bigger, we've had to, and our staffing obviously does not have the capacity to go back so much. So to make it fair to everybody, we that we don't go back for information that, um, and, um, well, it's not all the time, it's a bit of a complicated one. We'll go back for information if we haven't actually if you've, if you've provided us information, but we just needed further explanation, we'll go back to you then. But if you've completely, mis completely missed the mark and not responded at all, we'll probably make that ineligible. Um, a very big thing there with regards to so many applications, which I've noticed, is legal organisations apply not keeping their financials up to date. So it's really important that um, your financials are no more than two years old. And this is where, where in the organisation's registration section, it actually says what's your last financial order um, date. 
Um, if you are in corporate, obviously you ask us to be doing them every year. But if you have not done them for some, whatever reason and you have got bank statements for a more recent time, you can put that in. It's just that we need to say at this date, what are your finances looking like? And that's, again, and it'll, when I go further into the um, PowerPoint, you'll see that's one of the priorities that um, the committee look at. The last one there, just to note that legal entities can only apply their own right or sponsor one application at the same physical location. What that means is that legal entities can sponsor a few groups, but they can't sponsor. So say, let's I use boys as the example of a football club where they might have lots of little football clubs or hockey or whatever on the same grounds, but the legal entity is the only one who's incorporated. So say a rugby league club decides that they want to apply for something at, at their address at 1 Smith Street, and then they want to sponsor a hockey group that's still in their area, but they'll sponsor them. And they're also one semester. They can't do that. They only have one application of one area. And that's again to make sure that we're spreading across all LGAs and not, you know, getting too many funding to one LGA. Okay. Um, are your items eligible? Any items except those listed in the funding guideline as ineligible are eligible. So you'll see we don't have a lot of ineligibles, but you will see them. I think we're going to come through up to them. Um, the overseas suppliers, so what that's about, it says no items cannot be purchased from overseas supplies without prior written approval. That's about things in government trying to ensure that we are, you know, providing services and, and using the um, supplies that we have from Queensland and Australia. Um, if you can't, for example, you want quilt, uh, kilts, Scottish kilts, and you can't get them here, that's when you would write to us for approval and we go, yeah, well, that's reasonable. But if you wanted to buy some office equipment, some office chairs, and you put you get them cheaper in America. We would say, well, no, um, we need to use Australian suppliers. Okay. So, okay. So, I might request that I'm to Nelson. This is your ineligible area. Items purchased before notification in writing that the grant is approved. So, um, that's the reason we put that in is that if you are able to afford them, you shouldn't really be applying to us because we're trying to reach out to organisations that can't afford it. Also, you're not guaranteed funding. So if you do purchase them before, maybe on you know, after pay or whatever, you could get yourself in trouble. So it's not guaranteed to be fun. So we put that in. And that's been there for years. That's never changed. Grant writers and project management fees. So any grants writers out there, professional grants writers, I apologise but for what I'm about to say. But our grants are very simple to process and you should be able to contact us. We don't like seeing grant officers charging $3,000 for a $35,000 grant, which could take you maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes to write. So we really encourage you, you know your story better than anybody else. So we really encourage you to write it. We've got 16 amazing staff here who are all available on the phone, so you can ring at any time to get um, advice or, or, or ask about your application. Um, in saying that, don't move back to the last minute. We find sometimes that people, especially if our grants uh, round closes on a weekend, People ring us on Saturday, you know, we love our jobs, but we don't work weekend. So you need to make sure you've got a six weeks um, open where the round is open for you plenty of time to give us a call. So it's really important for the payment stuff. Repayment of debt, well, that's probably again uh, lots of times if you've already bought stuff, we call that retrospective funding. We, we want to be funded with that. You can't apply for overseas travel and you can't apply for good services that benefit from individuals. So you couldn't apply for, for example, mouth guards for. Um, football players or um, okay. um, and then gifts and alcohol obviously that goes without reason I don't have to explain that one. Um, decisions are requested un um, items unlikely to be funded. These are you can look at the list here the main reason for that is I'm not going to go through them all is that sometimes you might have a project that you're funding and you need to feed people if you're going to be doing in-house training or volunteers so we would might be considered catering Uniforms, maybe if they're something that the individual's not going to take home, like footy shirts that are ended up, you know, washed, taken off at the end and kept with the football club. Salaries and wages, we might consider if it's a salary or a wage to pay someone to hold training workshops. So they're considered unlikely. So the committee, we, we look at them, we look at the reasons why, and we go, oh, maybe, and we'll provide that to the committee to decide. Um, consider the funding priorities. So now priority ones, um, that's organisations affected by natural disaster. That also includes COVID-19. So if you've been affected by COVID, which I think everybody has been in the not-for-profit area this last couple of years, ensure to put priority one and sort of put why. So if you've been affected because you're a community group that have a, uh, uh, what we call it, a hall, 
and you used, used to use a lot of the funds because from people hiring out your hall and they're not using because they're not having function, put that as your reason. Um, priority two is facility improvements for equipment. Three, you can read all of that. Four, community events. And um, five is organisations that received a grant from us over 15,000 last two years. And again, as I've been blabbing on about that all the way through, we're really trying to ensure that we're giving everybody a chance to receive grants. So we're just trying to make it a bit more fair and equitable. Nearly there, guys. Um, this is where we talk about the um, determining prioritising factors where I mentioned the financial position. The reason why it's so important to have your financial position up to date because we do look at that, well, not me personally, but the committee and the age of the organisation. So they're like, they might look at that and think they don't have enough money or they have too much money and the age of the organisation. They look at that. So if you're very new, and I mean five months old and you've got no money, something you can't apply, but they might think, oh, might wait a bit longer, or they might think, oh, look, we can help them as a startup, no problem. So it is important to put that in. And say if you have got an age of an organisation and you're new, maybe you could just expand a bit more and say why you think it will be great and um, the need for the organisation and how you are going to be financially supporting yourself in this first year or two. Value for money for the grant, so obviously get plenty of quotes. Um, we might not ask you to provide us quotes, but we do say you it is by the government, you must have a quote. Um, contributions towards projects. So that's always a good thing. If we, there's a little ranking there that if you do contribute to a project, if you are considered, um, you know, they consider that favorable if they're comparing you with another one. Um, it doesn't have to be financial, it could be in kind. So say you're doing a playground and you've got a whole lot of trees that are chopped down. Let's not say trees because you get the license. Let's say you've got to cut some bushes down. And then you're going to get a working fee and which parents in the school are going to go and cut them all down. Put that down as in kind because that's that's good as well. Ability to generate income. So, for example, if you want to, to um, do a lot more fundraising, you need barbecues and um, mahis. You could um, put something where saying that if you were successful with the barbecue, you could do more fundraising, sausage sizzles, and that would provide some income. Benefits to more than one organisation. So that could generally meet most organisations that apply to us. Um, for example, um, a hall, community hall, that might say, well, if we are funded to update our hall and make it look pretty, we'll get more not-for-profit groups that will allow to come in for, you know, free to use that, like the local play group. Or if it's a football club that's us and to upgrade the lighting on their, um, on their uh, fields, it means also that the AFL or whatever, you know, so it's just to pretty much show that your um, it's not just your little group that's going to help, it's going to help the wider community. Um, geographical location and benefits origin. So that's also, oh, that's um, when we're looking at, say, across the regions, we look at what we're funding. So if we're, there's a whole lot of applications from Brisbane CBD, for example, or Brisbane Southeast, haven't got many from far north, um, they will look at that and how it would benefit that region. It might also look at the um, inability for um, groups that are way out um, that don't have the opportunity to fundraise as much they might consider in those geographic locations because they've got a lesser chance of getting um, funding opportunities than a group that's in Brisbane. Um, target group being existed, so we also look at the target groups. We make sure we try and get across all target groups. And that would be you know, women, you know, for violence, um, disability, or you know, across. And if there is a choice to pick there. Actually, on that note, I just noticed with my team, I've been looking through applications. A lot of people are just clicking um, as their service type as community. It's really important to really look at it because there's a whole choice. And I think people just pick community because it's an easy one. It covers everything. But for us to report it and to ensure that everyone is um, it's being spread across the different target areas, please consider it and have a look. It might help your organisation. If your community, they're going to think, well, we'll find it out in the community. Let's go and look at women or less than the children or youth. So it is important to really think about your project. And it's not about your actual organisation, it's about what your project's targeting. So you might be a school, but you're targeting, you know, helping, and oh, sorry, when I say school, PNC, but you're also, you're looking at um, helping an older group that are coming into use facilities. That means you'd be serving older people, even though you are a school for children. Okay, check the website for opening and closing dates. Prepare a realistic costing of requested items. Use in quotes. So don't just do an application put in 35000 and not really know what it's going to consider because it's more likely to be 
looked at if you provided a quote and we can go, right, they've really sussed that out and worked out what they need. So we've had times where someone's asked for solar grant for 35,000 and someone else has asked for the same thing for 15, well, they're going to go, oh, they haven't even done the homework. So they're good things to think about. Again, we said consider other community groups that use the benefit from your project. Contact your referees to support. So don't just put someone's name in and don't tell them. It's really important that you do let them know. Um, if you're undertaking a study upgrade, do you meet the criteria? And that means, have you gone to it? For example, if you've got it on the council land, you've gone to the council, not to get approval, building approval, but just for them to say, yeah, if you are funded that, we're fine with that. That's something we've noticed that people are not doing. And then when we get the grants to them, they suddenly the council says, well, actually, we had something else listed for that. You can't do it. And they have to return the grant. And it means an organisation that was ready to go has missed out. So if you are doing for a plan for a study upgrade on council property or any property and you're leasing, you're, you know, uh, leasing it, make sure you've had the lessors approval. And it doesn't, again, I've got to stipulate, it's not about building approval because that costs money and we don't want you to be paying out money for something if you're not successful. It's more about that they've just said, yeah, we're happy for you. If you are funded, yeah, we're happy for that to go ahead okay, there. Um, as for your mandatory bills, which we talked about before, explaining why the grant is needed. There's a section that says reason for grant. Really explain it. Don't just say we want a bridge because our other one broke. What's the ramifications for not having a bridge? Show your application to someone else for checking. That's always good. If you need help, consider us. You don't leave to the last one to submit. The application will be assessed by us, by the funding guidelines. Um, we'll be looking at all of those um, different areas of eligibility that we just went through. Uh, we'll then give it to our Attorney General for consideration and, and approval. We've got received an outcome approximately five months after the closing date, but I can comfortably say we might have pulled that back to four months now, So, um, but still work on five months. Um, if you are approved, you'll get approval letter email, so nothing's posted. Um, you also um, have that all in your portal. So um, you'll go to your portal when you get an email and have everything listed to what you have been funded for. Sometimes you might be part funded, but it's important to look because you might not have got the whole grant. Um, when you're purchasing approved items, keep in mind guidelines around variations. So if you're funded for a fridge, buy a fridge. If you suddenly decide you want a washing machine instead of a fridge, you've got to put through a request before you buy the washing machine. Um, if the total cost of the items is more than approved, your organisation will need to fund the balance. I'm rushing through here now because I know it's we've got a lot of other people to speak to. Um, if the application is not approved, we'll send you a letter advising why. If it's continued priority, we encourage you to apply again. If the application is ineligible, um, then eligible will email to advise you why. Could be that you have not done something correct. It's good to read that, understand why you're still confused about why you're ineligible. You can then ask you as well. Submitting acquittal docs, um, you'll get, obviously, you're going to purchase your items between six months and 12 months. The six months is equipment, 12 months we give you for facility upgrade. Obviously, you can um, log into the portal and simply put in for an extension of up to 12 months. Um, you, you upload your invoices. If there's any more than 15, you have to ensure that you um, get an order because it's just too many invoices for us to go through. And if your organisation in 2022 is successful for a super ad and you receive more than 35, you will be required to um, get an audit done on that. Um, you'll receive an email advice and you, this is that quitting grant. You'll receive email advice and you must wait one round before submitting your application. So I met before. And um, once it's all um, submitted, we'll send you information, say whether it's incomplete or complete. So here we've, we'll send you an email asking for further information. We'll also say that if you have not spent all your money, we might suggest you return it or you can put in for a variation for something in line with the original purpose. And any unapproved approved items purchased will request you to return the funds. God, this goes on forever, sorry. Changing, changing your grant. Again, we talked about variations. You must go onto the portal and vary your grant so um, before you ever go and purchase the items. This is going to be recorded and this um, PowerPoint obviously will be there for you. So I'm going to leave this for you all to read afterwards. It all refers to our funding guidelines. So everything I'm saying here is a summary of our funding guidelines. Um, variations for items that are not in line with original applications, they won't be approved unless they're considered natural dust, disaster or COVID. So if you decide that you need something now that you originally didn't apply for, but it's because you were affected by COVID, you have to put that through and we have to make that uh, considerate. And that goes to our committee for consideration. Okay. Um, again, variation request to extend the acquittal to date will automatically be approved. It's up to 12 months. 
but after 12 months, you'll have to consider it on the success and circumstances. Need help? There you go. You can contact us on the um, emails there or the web, look at our website or you can find us. You can also, I really encourage you all to click on our Facebook page because we've put some really good little memes up there now. And we've got little people, cartoon people telling you what's right and wrong that haven't applied. It's really layman's terms to explain what and what they are is from organisations that have contacted us and said where they have found confusion. So, by all means. And that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Was, thank you. That was very fast, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, but I know there was a lot of people there. And I only had 10 minutes back until it ended. Thank you. So, that was Community Benefit Funds Unit that do the gambling grants. So next we have Chris, and Chris is from Sport and Recreation, Department of Tourism, Innovation and Sport. Over to you, Chris. All right, thank you, Judy. I'll um, bring up my presentation to start. Should be coming up, hopefully. Yeah. Yep, cool. So just before I start, I'd just firstly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting today and, and pass my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm going to give you a good, a good one for that. I missed that one, Chris. Thank you. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just before we start, my name's Chris, work with Sport and Rec. Um, here in the Gold Coast, been on this role for, for quite a few years. So if there's anyone from Sportland out there, I might have, might have met you uh, in the past. I've had some dealings with Michael before with, with sporting clubs up the northern end of the coast. So it's a great opportunity to come along today. So thanks, Judy, for, for the invite. So just on the session. Is that what? Here we go, sorry. So this is in the session, just a quick update on, on sport and rec funding, um, what's available from our department and what we, I guess, essentially been doing uh, in the, the COVID response. Um, three programs that are open at the moment and, and one that's about to open at the end of the month, which will be, um, might be relevant to some clubs here today. So just a quick overview, when COVID was at its peak, um, we're in lockdown, there was a, a state government, Unite and Recover, um, Process and sport and rec was involved with a with a safe restart plan. So there's just a I guess a few few programs there that we delivered over the last 18 months, two years that that help clubs I guess get back on their feet post COVID. Um, a lot of clubs financially suffered with it; they couldn't operate, they lost income. Um, so some simple programs that to just help with with clubs and their operational expenses and and just getting back on their feet. So when sport could continue again, they were they were ready to go. The program we've got about to be released at the end of the month is um, Active Game Day Projects. It's a new program. Um, it's come out of the, the COVID um, situation as well. So it's an initiative that's going to help um, sport and rec clubs get back on their feet and, and invest in small scale projects that will benefit um, local communities. So the intent is that clubs will engage local contractors as well to do the work so that um, we can keep the economy moving and keep them um, to keep people working. Um, I will email this presentation to you, Judy, so people don't have to yeah, get yeah. you it, which would be great, but if they you know, don't have to take notes down, you can, you can have a copy of the presentation or make it a bit easier as well. So there's a standard 10 million budget for this program, um, and a million of that's going to be set aside for community use of schools projects. So basically um, projects on school land, it has to be state school land, Education Queensland, um, yeah. and ideally a club be using that school land at the moment so um, that information we can we can give you more if you're in that um, position the amount of funding available is up to a maximum of 150 and a minimum of, of 50,000 available for a 18 month time frame to, to do your project essentially though we'll be looking at funding projects from a minimum of 50,000 upwards first so I guess trying to spread as many yes are you able to make the slides move along I oh, can't you Sam? No, we've just on the first one. Oh. 
gossip. Sorry, I thought they were going okay. through. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, the, okay. Sorry, I was looking at a different screen. Yeah. So that was the first one. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, 50 up to 150. So when we're talking to clubs, we're we're probably advising start at 50 and, and work up. They're the program projects that'll be funded first. Um, there's two billion in the budget, but we'll get lots more um, application in the budget can allow. So I guess one way is to to spread as many projects across the state as we can is to um, work with smaller amounts first up to the to the maximum 150. So once the budget's exhausted. Um, that's when it will cut off. So, yeah, if you're not sure, talk to us about your project, and and you might have to rescope it to try and fit in those um those um timeframes and those that the, the the cost for your project. So the key dates it hasn't hasn't opened yet. It hasn't opened until the until the end of the month, 27th September. So we're in a good position now. If you're looking at this um this funding round, make sure you start talking to us there, as in sport and rec, and also council. You will need to be talking. With council, particularly if you lease a facility through council as well, so um, they're the things you need to be, be doing now. Um, so you are ready when it when it does open up. So you have until the fifth of November. Um, but as we know, as Siobhan will know, clubs will leave it to the last minute, the last hour. We get phone calls from clubs, so make sure you get onto us early. Um, we want to give you as much assistance as we can, so that's early we can talk to you the better. So make sure you make contact early, and projects will be announced early next year. So who can apply? Basically, this is only for sport and rec clubs. It's not open for all community organisations. So you have to have sport and rec as a as a focus and an objective. Um, so just check your constitution um, if you're not sure about that. But, but essentially, rugby league, tennis clubs, they're 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 easy. You know, you're you're eligible. Um, it hasn't changed again, has it? Oh, we can see active game day projects there. Okay, yes, sorry. So yeah, who's available? Sport and Rec Clubs. Um, councils can apply, but Council can only submit one application and and statewide multi sport um, organisations can apply, like a PCYC and groups like that. So there's two types of um, projects you can apply for, type one and type two there. So install or upgrade uh, lighting or development or upgrading your surface, plane surface. The priority will be given towards type one projects, 75% of the budget. Essentially, that's a, a lighting upgrade of a tennis court, bowls clubs, those kinds of um, yeah. those kinds of facilities. A field lighting will probably be more than 150,000, um, but it may not. So it, it's once you get your quotes in, you, you see where you're at. So to, to try and go on that 50,000 to 100,000 um, project type one, it'll probably be more of an upgrade of lighting. And, and upgrades, the key word there, maintenance and um, replacement or, or like for like is, is ineligible. So it's more of an upgrade. So you're going from one product um, to a better one. So you might be doing you know, old halogen lights at the moment and you want to upgrade those to, to LED lights. That's what we're looking for for those type one projects. Okay. So you can only do one, one application in each um, each category there, so you can't do a little bit of sports field lighting and a bit of upgrading your tennis scores. It's one or the other. Okay. Now, so next steps, make sure you talk to us now, myself, and there's also Esther that, that works in my office here, so we can help you with your application. Um, let you know if it looks like it yet, it's okay. It's on the right right path. Um, making sure that um, you start looking at the, the cost you're going to need. You're going to need three quotes. Um, you have to put in 20% contribution towards the project as well. Um, and, sorry, what's, what's on the screen now? I'm just making sure I'm on the right page. Active game day projects. What are the next steps? The, yeah. Okay. Right. And the next steps. Yeah. So, and also you have to, um, no issues with, with Office of Fair Trading. If you're not sure about that, we can tell you on the spot if you haven't done your annual returns or, or those kind of things. Oh. Um, yeah, so that's, that's an easy one. Clubs aren't aware. Sometimes it, it could be two years and they haven't updated. The secretary hasn't checked the mail or has left the club. Um, and, and they might be um, non-compliant with, with OFT, which means you won't be eligible under, under our programs. So we can give you a quick answer on that one. Uh, 
uh, and the other key bit there is talk to council as well. So whenever a club talks to us, it's you know the first question: does council know what you're doing, and uh, are they aware? Are they supported? And then we can start you know, having meetings with with everyone involved. So you're That's talking the divisions. Sorry? You're talking the divisions of council. No, yeah, talk to definitely the division, so let your council know, but, but more importantly, probably the sport and rec team within council. Okay. Um, Bruce Flick, Jody Pocock, um, if anyone is familiar with those names, that's the sport and rec team. They're the ones that will provide you the support letter permission you need in our application process. So if you don't have that uh, support, you won't be eligible either. So make sure you talk to them early about what you want to do. And, um, they don't have to give you money towards the project, they just need to provide that support in the application process. That is a key part. Um, that's probably all for active game day projects. Um, I can hang around at the end for questions as we're doing, Judy, or but over and after today. Shoot me an email or phone call and we can talk more about any projects you might sure. have in mind. So just some other programs we've had. These have been going for a few years and have been very popular is a fair play vouchers. So we found that and all parents would know that the cost of uh, you know, children playing sport is, is a key driver to whether they're going to actually participate or not. So the fair play vouchers come about where we have $150 vouchers so you go join a local sporting club. If you've got two or three kids and they want to play two or three sports, um, you, as we all probably know, it's, it's a lot of money that, to, to fork out. So the vouchers go a, a way to getting more kids uh, playing sport and involved in sport where they mightn't have had that, that opportunity before. So this one has two rounds per year. Um, yep. Used to be called Get Started Vouchers in the past, so that might be a familiar name. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, the 150 voucher is if you want to play soccer at a local club and it's $300, it'll only cost you $150. So you, you redeem the voucher with the club, and um, and the, and the club gets $150 back. So that's essentially that's how it works. Um, two rounds per year, as I said. Um, so who's eligible? It has to be Queensland resident between five and 17. Um, yeah. Parents have to have a healthcare card is, is probably the first criteria, but um, we'll go into a bit more about if, if they don't have that and that they still can be eligible. An eligible provider is not-for-profit sport and rec clubs. So referral agents, so if, um, if you don't meet the, the financial hardship criteria, you can go for a referral agent. There's some listed there. Um, like a police officer, a school principal or school garden officer and community health workers can, um, can be that referral agent as well. So if they might see that there's a real need here where this child would, would benefit from playing at a local club, they can jump in and, and be a referral agent and assist in that way as well. And just a bit more information there. So all the, there's a lot of info on the website as well about this. Um, most clubs are onto this now. They're, they're pretty switched on. When it comes out, and they they promote it well to their to their parents, um, and the budget does get exhausted pretty quickly for this one, as as you'd imagine, it's quite popular. So, um, and clubs do have to be on the website to be eligible. So, it's an easy process to to be on the website. So, if someone new is new to the Gold Coast and they want to play rugby league and they're in Coomera, they can go to the website. Hopefully, the local rugby league clubs on the website. We're doing the voucher with that club, and then. And off they go, they go play at that local club. And the last one we'll talk about, another one that's quite popular, merging athlete pathways. Um, probably council officers at your office duty, probably gets lots of requests uh, assisting young athletes that have been selected in state carnivals, national carnivals, even international yeah. carnivals. Yeah. Um, we've never had any funding programs we could assist before. So this one's come about to provide a, a bit of assistance um, and travelling to any of those events. Officials um, officiating as well can also apply for assistance if they meet the criteria. So who is eligible to apply? It has to be a Queensland resident, so again, under the age of 18. Um, residence for at least 12 months before the event. It has to be a road distance of at least 250 k's one way. There's a nice little trip plan on the website where you can where you can use that. To make sure you you fit in that distance, um, has to be a show and participation at the events confirmed by, by the coach or manager, and that event would be on our website as well. 
So if the event's not on the website, it'll be up to the sport to, to put it on there. So if it's the state gymnastics um, carnival, which will be eligible, but it just hasn't been uploaded to the website, we'll, we'll talk to Gymnastics Queensland, make sure they get it on there so that the child will be eligible to go to those events. Because we are such a big state, um, regional and, and state championships are held all over the, the state. So if you're in Gold Coast, they are held down this end a bit, but they can often be in Rocky and Mackay or, or Cairns as well. So um, it will certainly assist if you have to go that far. And this has increased also the amount that, that we'll, we'll give as well. So it's $200 under the, the, the three different tiers there. State or school event is $200. National or national school event. So it's just, it's club and school as well. So yeah, it, it's both categories there. And an international event, um, $600. I won't go into all the tiers there. And the last one is just a bit of an, an overview. Once I mentioned earlier, uh, the clubs, Active Clubs Kickstart program. There was two rounds of this um, when COVID, COVID hit. So essentially this helped clubs get back on their feet. Operational costs might be um, just your power bill if you could use a 2004. I guess traditionally items we've never funded before under our programs. So um, it was opened up that they could just just use the 2000 on on those kind of items and um, there was two rounds it was was very um popular as, as you could imagine and um there will be another round of it coming out again in the in the past the amount under active clubs was up to ten thousand dollars so it, it could go back to that amount or back to a five or seven thousand dollars um the, the, the round three when it comes out make sure you're, you're on our website we're talking to our office and we can give you information on that when it comes out and that'll be just for the sport and rec clubs as well. And lastly, just some information to follow up with myself or, or rest here in the office. Um, happy to come out and meet um, yeah, at your club, wherever, wherever you want, so we can talk for your, your project and make sure you give yourself uh, the best chance for success. There's no guarantees with our funding. The, the only guarantee is if you don't apply, you'll get nothing. So make sure you get something in and we'll try and help you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So that's Chris from Sport and Recreation, Department of Tourism, Innovation and Sport. So next up, we'd like to invite Nikki. Nikki's the Coordinator, Controlled Entities and Community Grants Officer with the City of Gold Coast. And of course, the City of Gold Coast have many grants to offer. So Nikki's gonna explain what sort of ones are out there at the moment and what sort of gets through a bit? Just a couple of tips, if you could. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you, Judy. Um, you may just have to add me as a presenter first so I can share my presentation. Didn't I can't I share that. it at the moment. Sorry, love. Where are you? There you are. There you go. Thank you. My pleasure. How does that look? Yep, I can see a lovely red screen and ready okay. to go. Ready to go. So um, Siobhan's actually in her presentation really touched on a lot of the um, elements that are um, sort of the same through Council's um, community grants program. So I probably won't um, go into depth in terms of um, some of the program nuances. But, um, and I'll also premise this presentation by saying that Council recently adopted um, a new community grants policy. So whilst um, some of the broader themes and programs are the same, there has been some changes to the threshold limits. And so um, my first suggestion would be to um, appraise yourself of Council's um, community grants page on its website. That really is um, a one-stop shop when it comes to Council's grant programs, opening and closing dates, um, acquittal forms, um, program parameters, things like that. So that's the, um, that's the website there. This is a, and I'll speak um, to these in more detail um, further on in the presentation, but these are essentially the community grant programs that Council offers under its community grants policy. Um, there's a number of them. They're funded from a number of different funding sources. Um, some of them are whole of city funding sources and some of them are funded by the divisional offices. Um, 
and as you can see there, some um, are fixed funding rounds and some um, are rolling programs, so we deal with them on request. Okay. Um, so um, all have different funding thresholds as well, so I can answer any questions on those further on in the presentation. Um, Again, across a lot of our grant programs, um, you need to be a community organisation. And whilst that's defined broadly um, in the legislation, um, we do restrict that somewhat within our uh, within our policy. So when you go to the community grants policy on the website, we list um, who are councils ineligible applicants. So um, in addition to you needing to be a an incorporated association or a company limited by guarantee with not for profit objects, um, or a company, proprietary company limited by shares, but again with not-for-profit object objects, um, you can't um, be an organisation that's already funded through another mechanism of council. So, um, for example, our rural fire brigades are funded through a special levy, so they are ineligible to apply under our programs. Any political advocacy groups um, or those who provide political donations to any of our councillors. Um, government bodies are, are not uh, eligible to apply to councils um, community grants programs and any organisations that um, either have an outstanding debt to council or an outstanding acquittal. So whilst we do allow you, because we've got such a plethora of different programs, um, we do allow um, organisations to submit across various programs because they have various intentions. Um, it, once you're, you've got an outstanding acquittal, you're then considered ineligible to apply and we, even if you do apply through the round, will remove your um, application from the, from the program. Um, so that's, um, that's obviously really the top line of whether or not you'd even be considered for an application. And then obviously underneath that, we also, as part of the application vetting process, look at um, your audited financial statements if they're available, if you're a registered charity, and we do all our due diligence to ensure that you're appropriately incorporated. You have no um, other outstanding compliance obligations associated with potentially a charity registration or something like that. Um, we also um, then look at um, whether or not um, when you're scored, um, the project's eligible as well. So that's really the next, um, next process that we go through and depending on the program is really what determines whether or not the project's eligible. So I'll speak to that in detail, um, but we don't broadly um, reimburse projects that have already been delivered. We don't fund anything that won't be paid prior to the determination of the grant. Um, and sorry, if I just flick across to the policy, um, we also don't um, fund things like capital projects on private land. So if a community organisation doesn't own the land on which they're operating or if they're not occupying council owned or controlled land then we won't fund things like solar panels on on a private property um, even if there's tenure in place through you know a lease or whatever for a community organization um, we won't um, fund any organisations where the project won't wholly be delivered and benefit the Gold Coast. So if there's um, a seniors lunch that might be um, apply for funding under our Seniors Week program and they want to um, hold a lunch just south of the border, um, which we've had in the past, um, we obviously won't fund that because we want the benefit to rest with the residents of the Gold Coast. Um, we um, also obviously have requirements around public liability insurance um, and the um, we also, in all of our grants, require, depending on the level of funding, contribution by council, various levels of um, recognition of council's contribution via a, a number of different mechanisms. We don't um, receive any late applications for any of our programs um, because we have very well publicised opening and closing dates and they're also standardised. Um, we also, using the Smarty Grants platform, can really see when groups, obviously, as any grant maker knows, we always have a late influx of submissions right at the 11th hour. Um, however, um, you know, we are open for a full month. Those programs are well publicised, so we feel in the interests of fairness and transparency um, that we do hold um, firm to that to that application deadline. Um, in terms of our acquittal requirements, um, we've recently changed. We used to have um, 
an acquittal threshold of under $2,000 wasn't required to be um, acquitted, but under our new policy, um, given it's public money, um, every cent needs to be acquitted um, and we can um, impose a more stringent acquittal um, requirements depending on either an organisation's acquittal history, so where we've found that an acquittal was um, not wholly satisfactory, then we, we can um, require enhanced acquittal requirements or we can do things like extend the acquittal time frame. Um, so normally, if we pay you money in this financial year, we will require that it's acquitted by 30 June in that financial year. However, of course, there's circumstances where uh, a project might be um, milestone based or multifaceted. There might be, um, it might not be due to be finalised or delivered until, you know, right at the end of the financial year, in which case we can extend that um, timeline on a request basis and we look into that on a case by case basis and that's included in your grant, grant approval. Um, so, I probably, given that um, we've really talked a little bit about who, um, I thought the value in this session um, from the city's perspective could really be about um, the things that we see that um, are the to do's and the not to do's. Um, Thank so, you. seeing a lot of um, grant applications, um, it really does to speak plainly, stick out like a sore thumb when um, applications have been well prepared, well thought out and well submitted. Um, where um, a project is poorly defined, it's very unlikely to be um, to be successful because council can't clearly un um, understand the benefit that it will be getting for its grant or its investment to the Gold Coast community. Yeah. So, um, we I would encourage any um, anyone that's looking to submit an application under our programs to really um, do the work in really defining what the project actually is. And whilst that might be really clear for some projects, for example, um, we need five new rolling grand, grandstands at the at the soccer oval. Um, it can be bamboozling sometimes to try and work out what actually some groups are actually asking for and equally um, um, where they can't clearly articulate what the benefit to the Gold Coast will be. So your greatest um, chance of success is when you really land to council um, a clear articulation of the benefit that this project will give to Gold Coast residents through whichever project stream you're applying for. Um, you know, they need to be proofread, they need to have no mistakes. We check your website anyway, so cutting and pasting things like the mission statement and the program intent and things like that don't necessarily add weight to um, the application, they just make it longer. Um, so often those um, really well thought out um, applications are the ones that score best. I um, mean, I will touch on what we score on in a second. Um, the other probably um, really key component is, and I know Siobhan did touch on it, is actually um, a really well composed and balanced budget. So um, when and again, like any funding program these days, um, we're underfunded and oversubscribed, um, in particular in a COVID environment. Um, and so council itself puts a lot of thought and a lot of effort into really doing a deep dive into the value for money aspects of these projects. And we try and do a lot of that heavy lifting for them at the back end by vetting the projects. So what does that mean? Well, it means practically that um, if, um, and it's obviously scope and scale. So if it's a five hundred dollar grant, then of course the expectation is not the same as if it's a if it's a fifty thousand dollar grant. But um, we don't like to see things that have large um, salary components that are not a clear nexus back to the project. Councils are not in favour of funding ongoing salaries anyway, um, because this is supposed to be a project that provides an enhanced benefit to the community that wouldn't be there anyway, otherwise. So it, it's not interested in funding, you know, operating costs for something. This is supposed to be something that's going to enhance the community. Um, food and, and beverage, uh, never any alcohol, we would never look at funding that. Anywhere where there's a an individual benefit, so things like uniforms, things like um, gift 
pampers, gift packs. Um, we would always look at things like um, if it's a an enhancement program or a mental health wellbeing seminar, how many expected attendees because we would always break that down into the cost per head and then therefore the benefit per head with the um, objective always being to try and spread that benefit to as many Gold Coast residents uh, as possible. So the policy is really the place to go for you to get a really good handle and understanding on the types of things that we do fund and the types of things that we don't um, and the new policy itself actually has a new section called requirements for applicants and it really clearly lays out um, for potential applicants um, really the do's and don'ts around our grants programs um, and threshold limits around um, some of our programs you can only um, submit one application per year some you can submit two um, sorry and then so just um, sort of following on for that. from that, um, I'll talk about how we make our decision so you can really understand how that essentially the decision gets made. Um, so applicants all apply through our Smarty Grants platform through the variety of programs. Um, they are then vetted for eligibility, so I've touched on that. So we'd be looking at is it an eligible applicant, is it an eligible project, history of funding, um, and then we send that to our evaluation panel um, and they independently score um, against a set of predetermined um, criteria. So the things that they're looking for and that they actually score on are does the community organisation have the capacity and the skills to deliver the project? Um, will it benefit the Gold Coast community as a whole, um, does the project and the expected outcomes align with council's relevant strategies and plans? So in particular with some of our more um, narrowly defined programs, I'd encourage you to go onto council's website and have a look at our um, um, corporate plans uh, and strategies because that can really help you land a clearly articulated application because you can understand what council's hoping to achieve in a broader strategic sense and you can try and align your project with some of those um, those strategic alignments that council's focusing on. And then really um, a large one at the moment for consideration is, does the project actually represent value for money? So often um, I see um, a lot of applications that may apply right up to the threshold of $20,000, um, might be a particular program and the upper limit's $20,000. And when you actually look at the project and you break it down and you get a deeper understanding of what the project is, you don't feel that um, as a grant maker that it does represent value for money in the broader cohort of the applications that we've received. So sometimes it's better to really um, do the work to really understand exactly the type of um, money that you need for the project. Um, and equally with that, um, we do require that if um, funds are unspent, that um, so the project might come in under budget, that those funds are returned to council or you can apply for a variation which is considered on a case by case basis. But again, similar to uh, Siobhan, we have a process for requesting a variation for a grant and that's done through our um, community grants email address which is available on the website. Uh, so that's really our um, decision making process. So applications get scored, they get a ranking. We then have a moderation session with our subject matter experts where they really, um, for want of a better word, sort of smooth the edges of the grant making process. So if we're oversubscribed, then that's when we turn our minds to things like partial funding, uh, value for money, can portions of the budget be funded and other portions not be. Um, and then for most of our programs, they're either uh, approved under delegation, um, but for others, they actually proceed to council and council itself makes the determination and any funding changes. Um, mm. Yes, yeah, so um, we, we are very lucky in that our councillors are uh, very engaged in the uh, grant making process and do take it very seriously. So. Um, they're very wedded to these outcomes. So yeah, we, um, we are lucky in that way. So that's really um, the process as a whole. Um, and I'll just run through our programs really, really quickly. So probably um, the um, 
most highest funded and premier program in the city is the recently named, uh, renamed Citywide Grants Program. Um, and it used to be called the Community Grants Program. And the reason that we changed the name is because we had a significant issue with oversubscription to this program or having applications received to this program that really didn't fit the program intent. So this is for um, programs that really do benefit the whole of the city and, and are accessible by all residents. So generally, if it's the soccer nets at the Narang Soccer Club, this is not the program that you should be applying under unless you're able to really demonstrate that um, you're rolling out a program suite that's about, you know, increasing the profile of soccer in the city or something similar to that. Um, but generally speaking, if you apply under this program, you won't be successful because it receives too many applications and never has enough funding. Um, and councillors themselves have a funding program for um, funding those more divisionally focused programs. Um, the community, uh, the citywide grants program um, has three categories in it. So minor grants, which are the smallest stuff up to two and a half thousand, um, with three categories under that being active communities, culture and heritage and environment. Major grants are up to $20,000. And then we have a special category called um, special funding. And that's really for those headline funding agreements for things like the Gold Coast Show and those really broad, broadly funded, um, you know, Gold Coast to Steadford, things like that, that really um, are real one-offs in the city. But they are are also funded under this program. Then there, um, then there is the um, discretionary grants program. So this is um, the discretionary funds that councillors have. So councillors themselves determine this program. Uh, it has an a funding threshold that changes annually, but it's generally the entire budget is just under forty thousand um, dollars this year. The minimum amounts to fifty. The maximum's ten thousand. But again, because it's a smaller budget um, councillors do tend to um, try and fund as many projects as they can within their division. That program um, runs generally um, after the citywide grants program, which opens on the 1st of July, but the dates for it do change annually. So you need to check discretionary grants on your website. Citywide grants doesn't though, it opens on the 1st of July every year. Um, NADOC and Seniors Week are largely self-explanatory. Um, but they open on the 1st of January every year. And the reason for that is the date generally of NADOC week and seniors week. We need to pay them well in advance of when they run. So we can't actually open them on the on the 1st of July. Um, they have smaller funding limits, um, I think $500 um, per uh, project. I'm okay. oh, sorry. $500 is the minimum up to 5,000. But again, the budgets for these are a bit smaller and generally the projects tend to be uh, smaller um, smaller projects often delivered by schools and things for, for NADOC week in particular. Um, so that's those two. Um, community facility grants is um, funded through um, more divisionally focused funding sources and it is for capital works or capital renewal projects on council owned and controlled land. So by that, I'm talking about the soccer club needing a new kitchen, things like that. So, but it's only in those instances where there's actually a lease that's been entered into between council and the community organisation itself. Um, and they have uh, obviously larger um, thresholds because it's a capital based project up to $250,000. Um, and that project uh, program is um, obviously wedded um, to um, the divisional councillor and what they're looking to see in their division in terms of community development and support. Um, and it's a rolling program, so it's open all year. Equally, the community event grant program is open all year. Um, you can apply anytime, the link's on the website. It is for community events in the city that are open to the public. So the, the clincher with this one is that they must be open to the public. So things like a soccer club's annual awards dinner will not be funded under this program because it's just not benefiting Gold Coast re residents generally. Um, events can be ticketed. They used to not be able to be ticketed, but we found with COVID um, it was meaning that a lot of um, events were largely unfinancial if they couldn't be ticketed. Yeah. The um, minimum amount um, 
application amount for this grant is 250 and the maximum is 50,000. Again, um, some of the larger events like Swell and things like that do receive funding under this program. Um, anything above $20,000 needs to go to council for approval, otherwise it can be approved under officer delegation. Um, and again, the, the applications for these are largely self-explanatory on the website, but again, it's about really landing what the benefit to the Gold Coast will be through some of these programs and events. Catchment and Citizen Science, um, it's a catchment management funded program and it's really about um, enhancing the ecological sustainability of Council's um, waterways and um, it opens on the 1st of July every year. So we've just closed for this year. Um, and then the last program I'll touch on um, is the Emergency and Extraordinary Grants Program. This was newly introduced um, when the policy was adopted 18 months ago. And this program was specifically around helping those clubs that may find um, an issue with potentially their premises or uh, with their operations that they cannot fund themselves but which will compromise their operations. It could be something like termites in the rafters which poses a safety threat or an, a dangerous tree or it might be that a group has been um, offered an opportunity to compete somewhere that they would ordinarily not be able to afford to go. This is the program that you apply under, but you need to be able to demonstrate that you couldn't plan for it, you couldn't see it happening, you, you couldn't budget for it because uh, it's a it's a by request program. So again, we need to make sure that um, it's fair to all community organisations. So we don't want, um, this is essentially an emergency program to really cater for those unforeseen or um, un, unbudgetable items that a community organisation may come up against. And then I'll, the very, very last thing I'll sort of say before I wrap up is Council also um, provides some in-kind support to community organisations and this is something that's just been formalised in the new policy. Um, that's things like meeting hire of Council's owned and controlled properties, um, tube stock from Council's nursery and photocopying. There is limits on those. Um, it's a very small program, $250 per community organisation and they can have up to four requests per year. Um, the requests are funnelled in through the councillors, divisional offices, but essentially um, if community organisations do need some assistance with things like printing, um, if they may want to um, have access to council's tube stock for an event, if they want to hand out free trees, that type of thing, then there is capacity as well through the new policy um, to do that. So that's a bit of an overview. Um, happy to take any questions at the end, but uh, I hope that touched on everything. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so scope and scale was two words that I took out of Nikki's um, presentation there. So thank you for that. And that was Gold Coast City Council, um, Nikki Moore. And we're now handing over to Nathan. Nathan's from Stuart Roberts' office and Nathan's talking on behalf of um, Federal Men Member for Ford and the Federal Member for Fadden. Nathan uh, is talking federal grants and eligibility there. So are you able to take the screen, Nathan? Thanks, Judy. It's just uploading now. Okay. Who's, whose emails are those? Nikki. That one. Okay, all yours, Nate. Thank you, Judy, and thank you for um for inviting us along this afternoon. Our pleasure. Okay, so I just wanted to give everyone a a basic overview. I don't want to go into too many details and bore you all with the uh, the the eligibility criteria and all the technical details. I basically wanted to whet your appetite just to give you an idea of the amount of grants available. Uh, through your federal representative offices. So that includes uh, Stuart, Robert, on this side of the freeway, on the eastern side, and Bert Van Men and the federal member for Ford on the western side. So a couple of ones I wanted to touch on this afternoon was the Stronger Communities Grant, uh, the Volunteer Grants, the Power and Communities Grant, and the Sporting Champion Grants. So the Stronger Communities Grant, minimum of $2,500 and maximum of $20,000.
That's available for small capital projects that encourage and support participation in local groups, improve local community participation, and contribute to a vibrant and viable community. Things like, oh, hi, Mr. Crandon. <laughs> oh, hi, how are you, Nathan? <laughs> well, thanks, how are you? Good, uh, so out here in the desert. <laughs> Things that are eligible under this type of grant would be clubhouse upgrades, extensions to toilet blocks, things like that. New equipment, so machinery, mowers, anything like that. Uh, vehicles, barbecue trailers, anything that uh, that helps with the local community. Uh, surf life saving material, uh, any medical transport needs, things like that. So it's a pretty broad uh, scope. Uh, if you have any questions, more than welcome to come through the office here and we can talk you through those uh, those options. So it's a yearly grant and unfortunately the 2021 round has already been concluded. But the way it works is you need to put in an expression of interest to your local MP, either that's uh, Bert or Stuart, depending on which side of the freeway you live. So if you were successful in the EOI process, organisations are then invited to apply through the government grants portal. Uh, just with that one there, previously it was a 50-50 grant, so it would mean that if you applied for $20,000, your organisation would need to put in $20,000. Now that's either cash or in kind. So for example, if you were building a, uh, a deck on the side of your clubhouse and you received $20,000, you would need to find $20,000 in cash or if you had a working bee, all the volunteered and donated labour and goods would go into that in-kind contribution. The reason that was stopped was because of, uh, during COVID, understandably with the clubs and the financial pressures uh, experienced during COVID, the government uh, allowed for, I think it might be this year only, I just, I'm just i not certain that they, the 50-50 contribution is, is not required. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that one there. The next one is the volunteer grant. So that's a minimum of $1,000 up to $5,000 per community organisation. So it's for not-for-profit community organisations to support the efforts of Australian volunteers. So the criteria with that one is your organisation must have at least 40% of the activities undertaken by volunteers, covers things like IT, volunteer software, fuel cards for volunteers. For example, if you're part of the Meals on Wheels program, and they use their personal cars, you can give them some fuel vouchers to cover the costs and, and help keep the cost down for volunteers. Uh, it can cover safety equipment, first aid kits, defibrillators. Uh, it can also cover training. So if you wanna send some of your volunteers to CPR courses, uh, CPR, first aid, or all those type of training activities, it covers that as well. That's a yearly grant as well. Uh, unfortunately, 2021 has already been concluded as well. Again, it's the same process, so expression of interests are submitted through your local federal MP. And then if you're successful, uh, organisations are invited to apply via the government grants portal. The next one is the Power and Communities Grant. So that's a minimum of $5,000 up to $12,000, and that's for any energy efficient practices and technologies leading to a reduction in energy use, improvement in energy productivity and delivery of carbon abatement. Basically, in a nutshell, this one is to help reduce energy consumption and energy costs for local organisations. So you can include one or more eligible activities, the most popular one being solar uh, panels and batteries. Uh, and there is one organisation that put in for a solar fridge, and that was so they could do some fundraising at other events. So a solar fridge and battery, so that was uh, quite ingenious. Now that's a new grant, 2021, that's the first time this one's been offered uh, and it closed yesterday afternoon. So I'm, I'm sorry about that one, uh, that uh, being finalised at the moment. Again, expression of interest through your local federal MP and ex if successful, you'll be invited to apply via the government grants portal and eligible organisations list. That's a bit tighter than all the other grants. Uh, so just check on the website for an exhaustive list of eligible entities for that one. So for example, PNCs aren't able to apply for that one. Uh, the last one I just wanted to touch on is the local sporting champion grant. So that's for individuals, this one not as an organisation. It provides financial assistance for coaches, officials and competitors 
aged 12 to 18 participating in state, national, national or international championships. Uh, so the base grant is $500, extra $100 if you're traveling over 800 kilometers, and then an extra $200 if you're traveling internationally or more than 2000 kilometers. Uh, so that one is available four times per year, so every quarter. The next round closes on the 30th of September this year. Uh, so you just apply for that one, not through your federal MP, but that one's through sportoz.gov.au. Uh, eligible applications are then sent to the MP's office. They have a local committee to determine the successful recipients, and then the recipients are notified by the MP's office. So just some helpful hints with the EOI process. So they are all submitted to the MP's office uh, and then there's a local committee that meets to assess the EOI. So they just have a look over them. The committee then advises the MP of the successful EOIs and the successful applicants are then invited to apply via the government portal. Just a disclaimer here that the MPs are not involved in deciding the outcome. So it's not up to the MP to sit there and decide. They delegate that out to a local committee and then the committee makes the recommendations back to the MP. Some more helpful hints. What the local committee look for is whether the project meets the objectives of the grant, e.g. reducing energy bills or supporting volunteers, whether the project demonstrates good value for taxpayer money, uh, the capacity of the organisation to manage the grant, the number of community members that it will benefit, and the fundraising activities undertaken by the organisation. For example, does your organisation solely rely on government grants or are the uh, other members out there actively participating in other fundraising activities such as bunnings, sausage sizzles, things like that? So they want to look at how much effort the clubs have put in uh, to fundraising themselves as well. So just a bit of uh, information there. I, I briefly touched on it earlier. So the western side of the M1 is Ford. That's Bert Van Menen MP, the federal member. And the eastern side is uh, Stuart Robert MP. Their websites are there, uh, robert.com.au and bertvanmannon.com.au. If I could also just briefly encourage you to jump onto the Community Grants Hub. It's a fantastic website. Uh, you can subscribe for information. It's got all the information on those grants, but it also has a plethora, a plethora of other grants available uh, if you wanted to touch base and have a look on that one there and subscribe for more information. And that is my presentation, Judy. How'd I go? Thumbs up. Hang on. Let me do the thumbs up. It did good. <laughs> oh, brilliant. And 10 minutes for Q&A. We made it. There you go. So, spotlight on Michael. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> That's not Michael. Oh, well, there's Michael there. Ah, oh, down there. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, look, uh, can I just first of all thank uh, Judy? I know there's some question a Q and A at the moment ten, with ten minutes yep. up your sleeve. I won't get involved in that. Obviously, I haven't been here. Uh, but Judy um, Grimes from my office, thanks thanks to her for doing a fantastic job of pulling all of this together and jumping into the hot seat because of my commitments to the uh, to the hearings in town, the PCCC hearings in town, um, which con concluded today, and I've just managed to get back to the office now. Um, but I see that we've, uh, Sh Choban, uh, Kedon? Siobhan? Oh, Siobhan, oh, okay. Uh, Siobhan, <laughs> thank you. Um, Grants Officer Community Benefit Fund Unit, uh, Department of Justice and Attorney General, that's fantastic for you to uh, come along. I see Chris uh, Wagland uh, from Sport and Rec, Department of Tourism, Innovation and Sport. Nikki Moore, Coordinator, con uh, Controlled Entities and Community Grants, City of Gold Coast. Fantastic to have you along, Nikki. And I think I arrived more or less when you came on uh, on board, but I, Judy was well and truly uh, into things. Um, and um, we also had Nathan there a moment ago. Did we have Vanessa uh, doing doing some talking as well, or did Nathan do it? All oh, right. OK. And of course, Matt, uh, Councillor Mark Hamill's um, um, support, uh, uh, Matt, whose surname uh, escapes me for the moment. But look, thanks, guys. Uh, and all of all of those of you that have tuned in to have a listen to these um, uh, to these folk and, 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 you know, hopefully you've got something out of 
uh, something that Judy uh, was keen to see us um, pull together uh, for the Northern Gold Coast. We are, after all, the fastest growing region in Queensland. Uh, and I say that so many times and I never get sick of, of reminding people that that's the case. Uh, but it is absolutely true and we need all the help we can get because you as community groups are, if you like, the, the, the organisations that bind the community together. Whether you're a sporting group, whatever your group is, you're part of the community and you're binding the community together. And that's so, so important, particularly with a fast growing uh, region like uh, the Northern Gold Coast. Uh, I will say one thing, and I don't know whether, whether Judy's mentioned it. Um, we've just done another run of bottled water, uh, 16,000 or so bottles uh, of bottled water just down the road here and available for people, uh, for organisations to uh, just receive from us. We're happy to, to give them if you've got a function, an, uh, a, a function happening or indeed uh, for our footy clubs and so forth, uh, we make that, that water available so you can sell it over the counter. The whole idea is that I don't have the budget to be able to give out large amounts of money to the community, but if you think about it, you know, 16,000 bottles of water uh, at $2 a bottle, if you're able to sell it, sell it all uh, for us, well, there's, there's $32,000 that we're investing into the community and, uh, and we'll run another 16,000 uh, bottles after that. So just keep that in mind. All you've got to do is contact Judy uh, in that regard and um, she'll run it by me as to the quantities, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think I've ever said no to any uh, quantity. Uh, there's plenty there and it's there for you guys to try and make a dollar out of. I know uh, the likes of uh, Volunteer Marine Rescue, uh, we donate it to them, not for sale, but for them to use because obviously they're, they're going to go through a lot of water. Also, our rural fireys, we're always happy to uh, to keep them supplied with water as well. Anything else for me, Judy? No. All done. Thanks once again for coming and I'll leave it to uh, who's going oh, who, Who's going to do the... Judy's Hello. coming back around. Yeah. I'll leave you guys to it. All the best. And uh, hey, we'll have to do this again. <laughs> okay. So, if any of our viewers have got any questions, um, you're most welcome to type it. We can see the chat and then our guest presenters will be able to answer. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating. So, we do have a couple of cheat sheets that I will be able to email everyone. Oh, can you see those? Yeah, there. Um, as well as the presentation from the ladies and gentlemen and the PowerPoints that have got so much information that is valuable to every one of our groups. So if anyone's got any questions, that would be lovely. Oh, Roz is typing. Hello, Roz. Welcome to our world. Would it be easier that I gave Roz the camera? Yeah, it would. Roz, we're a school PNC. Can we apply for more than one? I missed the end, sorry, Roz. More than one grant at the same time from different organisations. So, um, yeah. yeah. Quick answer is yes, but I guess they've got to be eligible under those different, um, you know, programs. Yeah. So PNCs aren't eligible under some of theirs, but obviously are again with PNC, PNCs are eligible for Gold Coast City Council, aren't they? Correct, yes. Yeah. But again, depending on the program in terms of whether or not the application would be successful. Yeah. yeah. And the same with um, getting the key benefit fund. Um, but we, if we were looking at, so we're looking at, Part fund from us and cut fund from another um, funding group, we'd be considering that as well because we wouldn't want to combine after grant they were successful for some So it depends if they're two different projects or one project they're money. So Bodhi's got a question, so let me give him the camera. Go, Bodhi. Are you there? I am, thank you. Um, and great presentation, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. 
Yep. Excellent. Um, sorry if I've got a bit of glare. I'm just dialing in from um, work still in the city. Um, so I just had a quick follow up question for Nathan, which is sort of twofold. So the first one was um, around the power and community grants um, application that was submitted. There seemed to be a restriction on the um, word limit in the EOI. Um, does it help community or if community organisations supply like a attached Word document when they send through the EOI, um, adding extra information that might be used by the community group that's actually um, providing the recommendation to the minister? Or is is it sort of we've got to try and be as succinct as possible and get it through in that sort of 100 word um, grouping? Thanks, Bodhi. If you could preferably keep it to the one page, just so the committee isn't you know, trolling through hundreds of different applications. And it's also to make it fair so that everybody can just have that one page application. Great, I love to waffle. Um, and my only my only other question was just sort of focused on the um, in-kind contributions that we'd be putting forward if the federal grants do go back to the 50-50 sort of funding arrangements. Um, are there any specific rules around the valuation of the sort of capitalization of labor that we put through for working bees? So I suppose I could say that I'm accounting for $100 per hour for every person that's contributing to a project, or is that sort of something that um, is looked at quite closely? Like, is, is there any guidelines around in-kind valuations? Yeah, absolutely. So they allow for a project manager and there's a set rate per hour for a project manager to donate their time. And then there's a set rate for volunteer labor as well. I think it's about $25 per hour. Uh, I just haven't looked at it because I didn't need to this year, uh, but they do set down the amount per hour per volunteer. Perfect, I'll keep an eye out for that um, if the rules change. That's it from me. Thanks for that, guys. Thanks, Brady. Thank you. I can't see any other questions popping up. Um, like I said, there's so much information that I'm going to be able to share with everyone that registered, even if they were unable to attend today. Um, I really need to thank my guest speakers. Your knowledge and sharing your time with us is really ap appreciated. So uh, if we haven't got any more questions, we might turn the tape off and go home for dinner. What do you reckon? <laughs> Sounds good. Bye, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll email everyone. Thank you for your time.